you were working as a waitress in a cocktail bar when I met you. I picked you out, I shook you up, I turned you around, turned you into something new. <laughs> Don't you want me, baby? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, we are floating and scream a celica. My name is Kevin Graham, and as usual on these Tuesday nights, Tales of the Unexpected, I'm joined by Russell Boyce. Russell, how are you on this fine evening? Ah, brilliant, mate, brilliant. I'm looking forward to those intros now more and more each week. That is, uh, and it's been a good variety of lyrics you've chosen so far as well, Kev, so keep that work up, mate. That's brilliant, man. Bit of Human League to kick us off this week, and that's... Aye, that's been uh, that's been some different eras, some different genres. Love it, mate. Love it. Uh, the last two have been the early eighties. Then we had the beat. We had the Beatles the first week. Last week was uh, uh, what's his name? Hit me with your rhythm stick. Uh, hit me with your rhythm, Ian rhythm, Jury. Rhythm, Ian Jury. And this week we've got the Human League. Um, but I think before we get started tonight, Russell, I think I've got to ask you a question. You ever <laughs> been a waitress in a cocktail bar? <laughs> Well, I used to I used to sing that to some of the barmaids. You were working as a waitress in the crooked arm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, hey, that works. That scans all right. Eh? It doesn't uh, actually scan. That works well, eh? Uh, uh, it all right, mate. <laughs> do, you miss it? Do, do you miss the pub? Oh, I miss loads of aspects of it. I mean, I think I need to be honest and say, I mean, it's a lot of work, to be totally honest to you. I mean, it's something that you would really... You need to... Um, you need to you need to be willing to dedicate your life to it, Kev. If you know what I mean. Otherwise, Aye. it'll not work. It's a six day a week job. Do you know what I mean? Which suited me fine, to be honest. With you. I loved it, but I mean, I think it's um, for the rewards now. They're going down all the time, even though people are probably to make a good living out of uh, having to increase their increase their hours. So I'd recommend anyone to give it a go if they can get a reasonable deal on it. Though, do you know what I mean? Because it Aye. is. Uh, it was a special time, definitely, man. I'm, uh, I'm too lazy for that, man. I'm, I like being in my bed for ten o'clock and stuff like that. Eh? I'm not, I'm not a late night owl. Used to be, but no anymore. Eh? So uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm not into. Also, I'm teetotal, eh? so I've got well, a I, bit of, so folk. That's get, a bit of a hindrance. I mean, I didn't even usually have had my dinner till after ten at night. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm tucked up in bed with a good book before just after ten o'clock at night. Um, well, but before, in, in the good old days, as so folk would have called them, I went out on a Thursday night and didn't come back to the Sunday, eh? but that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's like, the days are long, long gone, man, long, long gone. <laughs> but we may as well go back to one of the days. Um, so where are we this week? We're April 2008, we are this week, and the, the DeLorean has skidded to a hall outside snooker scene. On the Toll Cross Road. Do you ken the Snooker Scene Club? On the yeah, Toll yeah, Cross yeah. Road? So it's a Wednesday night and uh, we're a wee bit early, Russell, so we're going to go in for a couple of pints because I'm yeah. like a, a couple of wee frames of snooker, eh? And we see, like, at this point, well, I'll get a wee snooker reference in here, eh? It looked like Celtic were needing snookers to win the league at this point, eh? Because going into this game, we're playing Rangers on a Wednesday night if nobody's actually worked this out yet. Um, 16, <laughs> 16th of April 2008, we're playing Rangers at Celtic Park. Uh, we're four points behind Rangers who have two games in hand. Uh, basically, right. basically due to their quest to become the worst ever side to reach a UEFA Cup final, which, right. sees, which sees them previously cancel games uh, get a couple of games postponed because of the weather. Then just after this game, they bleep for a season extension, which they did get. Then they let this myth come round that they never got a season extension. I mean, has the season ever finished on a Thursday night since that game? No. Since that year. So when has anybody ever heard of the season finishing on a, on a Thursday night? Eh? So they, so they eventually they bleated enough and the SFA and the SPFL, whoever it was at that time, bent over backwards and gave them a season extension. We're going into this game and we have they scored a, a goal at home for three games. Our last home game saw us lose to 10-man Motherwell. Can you guess who got sent off for Motherwell that game? Ex-Rangers player. 
liked signing dodgy things when he signed his name. Showing me a bit here, like kind of. I usually I like these questions, eh? Uh, Motherwell player, but uh, Mark Brown. No, no. no. It, it was Bob Malcolm got sent oh, off for. I forgot he played for Motherwell. Uh, it was Bob Malcolm. He got sent off for horse and uh, Massimo Donati up in there. Um, so after that game, I remember that game quite clearly. Eh? Oh, it was a horrible feeling because we thought that was it. We had blew the league at, mm -hmm. at that point. Eh? The team left, sulked off the party booze, and it was really, really horrible. It was absolutely toxic. I, I, I do remember it. Eh? And like that game, that was like, oh, this is unbelievable. Because the bottom line was, and I say this last week as well, this wasn't their very good Rangers side either. Even though mm. they got to a UEFA Cup final, they were spawny all the way through to that. But I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Eh? <laughs> um, some, some Albert Bramble's already came into the comments. That's Tommy gone 13 year, one time Burns. Neil Lennon had just replaced Tommy uh, in the first team coaching staff at this point. Yes. And as far as I can remember, and I might be wrong here, eh? We were, it was never disclosed how seriously old Tommy was, eh? It was never, it was never like, I don't think they were ever told that he was in the, the, the last days of no. a, life, a life where he's actually touched everybody, whoever met him and whoever's got any any heart to do with Celtic whatsoever. Um, and beyond. And, and beyond, and still, be, and, and still beyond. And eh? beyond. Um, so, Russell... I've hammered you at snooker a couple of eight, nine breaks. That's about my limit. <laughs> that's, about, that's about my limit in snooker. <laughs> uh, so, going into this game, what's your thoughts? What are you thinking about the 16th of April 2008 as we're walking to Celtic Park? I was in a positive mood, funnily enough, Kev. And I, I remember this season as the Mind the Gap season, and I had a feeling... I, I, I was very much of the opinion, I don't want to focus on them too much, but I mean, I was of the opinion they were murder. Um, and that it was just, they were, they were I, I felt they were, they were creaking a wee bit as well. They weren't dominant. It wasn't like this was a team that you thought, wow, we're, no, we're never going to make it back. Even though we're needing snookers, as you rightfully pointed out, I was actually, I had a good feeling, uh, to be honest with you, we were going to beat them. And then if it was not my, if my memory serves me right, we played them again. Or is this the second time we played them in the space no, of three weeks? This is the first time we, we played them a couple of weeks. We, call, we played them a couple of weeks later on a, a, a glorious Sunday afternoon. And that's at Celtic Park as well, isn't it? Uh -huh. Which was unusual. And I always remember thinking, I know they've got the two games in, but we've got two games right near each other at home. And I felt we were the better team than them. Uh, I'm, we're walking up to Celtic Park, Kevin. I'm telling you, we are gonna we're gonna do this. There's magic in there. We're gonna beat them tonight. That is definitely what my mindset was. I felt we would win. I mean, you've got you've, as well. I'll help, I'll read out the Rangers team for that night before I go to the Celtic team. As we right. says, and this is us looking through. As I said just the green tinted spectacles, right? Of course, but, it is. But you've got Alan McGregor, who I must admit had a great season that season. He carried them all the way in Europe yep. that season. You've got Broadfoot in their back line. You've got Carlos Querla, Davy Weir, who's all, who was about the same age as me at that point, Papak, Papak eh, however you say his name, Christian Daly, Boy Whitaker, Barry Ferguson, Steve Davis, Elbows McCulloch, and somebody called Dartsville. That That's team nice. is ranked rotten. They are the worst team ever to re reach a UEFA Cup final. <laughs> that, 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 that's the worst squad ever to reach a UEFA Cup final. It's got to be. The Celtic team that night, and we'll talk about this, because we're going to talk about the partnerships in this team, two great partnerships in this team. Uh, the Celtic team that night was the Holy Goalie, Andreas Hinkle, Gary Caldwell, Stephen McManus, uh, Lee Naylor, Matt Wilson came on for him at half time. Nakamura, Hartley, Hartley Robson, eh, Magidi McDonald, and Venegura Hesselink. On the bench is Matt Brown, strangely enough, the Celtic goalie, eh, <laughs> Paul, Paul, Paul McGowan, Evander Snow, Massimo Donati, and Bobo Baldy is on the bench. And that, that came, when, I, when I read this, I was like, oh, 
when I had them, I, 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 I can't remember Bobo being on the bench. Um, yeah, he was in a yeah, he was he was in the, the Twilight Zone by then, wasn't he? I mean, he, he, he was he hadn't, he hadn't featured, I don't think, at all that season. Because even, a, I mean, I know uh, the producer Paul is I am very keen on the kits that Celtic wear at the time, and I suppose I think we all do a wee bit. You associate players with certain kits. I always find it odd, right? I'm already away on one. I find it odd sometimes, right? See, when you see footage of Alan Thompson playing in the Nike shirt, mm-hmm. Ken Strachan's first season, or you see uh, Sutton in that shirt, it always throws me. Even though Hearts did a full season in that shirt, he, I still think they look odd in it. Bobo Baldi, that year, that shirt was the one with the, the white collar, wasn't it? It was like the white round yes. neck. It was the white round neck collar. It, it, it was a funny it was the 40th anniversary of Lisbon top. Aye. I, I can't I remember. Bobo Baldi ever wearing no, that. No, can't I would be baffled if I'd seen him in that. Um, so. Aye, aye, you're right. I, the guys who I picture wearing that kit are Scott McDonald. Aye. <laughs> Very good, a Hesselink. Totally. Uh, Robson. Paul oh, Hartley, yep. McManus, Caldwell. They're the guys I picture wearing. Hinkle, I actually did picture Hinkle wearing that kit. Eh? But I didn't yes. picture Bobo Baldy wearing that kit. But he's still... And the, and the thing is with Baldy there, right? Strachan, this is now his approaching kit. The end of season three of Strachan, isn't it? Aye. This is for three in a row. Mm. How is Baldy still there? Because <laughs> he was on, I know he was on a big contract, wasn't he? Um, Aye, it, but I was convinced that had been sewn up. I must admit, on the Celtic wiki, uh, I always look at the team like when I watch the highlights, I then go in there and read the lineup. And the Baldy one at the end, I kind of, I actually thought they might have got it wrong. So uh, <laughs> I, honestly, maybe, I, maybe, maybe they have got it wrong, but I don't think so. I, 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 I need to check the Celtic wiki after this. But I remember him playing a game at Tanadice under Strachan when he had been like ostracised for. Like mm-hmm. months and months, and he ended up playing at Tanadice because I was, uh, and I think that was a Christmas game. Uh, I, I, I don't You're know, I can't uh, remember. I was in Lockie before that game, so I might have imagined it. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I didn't again, anyway. There's 58,000 here, and the referee's Kenny Clark, but we'll come to Kenny Clark later. Um, but we had not scored a goal against Rangers for one year. We had not beaten Rangers for one year when this game kicked off. But the tone of the game was set right for the off. Uh, we Stratton had paired Barry Robson and Paul Hartley in the middle and it was working yep. a treat because basically we needed to dig out results. It would keep us in the title race or at least put pressure on a Rangers team that you've already quite rightly says looked like they were flapping by this point. Yep. They, they, they looked like they were abs- absolutely flapping by this point. And we looked like... On paper, we had the better side. We had the better players. Uh, but this Rangers team had found a way to boringly win, a formula to boringly win. They would play for draws. They would go one nothing up and they would sit in defence and they would they would grind days out. I mean, they were as boring as, as they were as, as ugly as their coupons, actually. They, they, were a, they, were a, they were a horrible team to watch at that time, eh? I mean, I think the whole of Europe hated them at that point and didn't they want them to have any success. But the game kicks off, eh? Within nine seconds, there's a high ball and Barry Robson clatters into, uh, clatters into Christian Daly. Swings an elbow, eh? That's an elbow, eh? And, he, and then Robson flattens the wannabe Stone Roses guitar playing indie curly-haired freak that he is. And... Like Daly gets up, uh, Daly, Daly, Daly gets up absolutely angry, and I, I, I reckon when you actually see it on the telly now, I reckon his hair starts going curlier <laughs> as he gets up because he's that angry. He goes a bit sideshow Bob, eh? and, he's, and he's fuming, and and, and he's fuming at uh, Kenny Clark for no gain for for no gain the free kick, and that set a tone that night because Celtic Park went mental after that. We went, oh, we're up for this tonight. As I say, that there was a, a myth gone about at that point that Gordon Stratton couldn't beat Walter Smith. We That's had to right. beat them for a year, but couldn't we couldn't score couldn't score a goal against them, eh? 
Just when I mentioned Christian Dale, do you remember him when he broke into the Dundee United team in the picture of them playing the, the acoustic guitar and he was like a sort of like Man Manchester 1990 indie kid? Do you not remember I don't him? remember that. I remember one of my first football memories is, is Dundee United winning the Scottish Cup, funnily enough, because it would be about seven or eight then. And I, I remember it was him who it came off the post and it went came out to Brewster. That was Christian Daly who was busting up the left wing for Dundee United. And uh, aye, that's like that's how I remember it. But he had the, he had the curly hair. Now he must have played about forty three thousand positions, Kyle. He did. He, he must have played for about forty three thousand teams as well. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of other other football players that played the guitar. Uh, Stephen Thompson. Stephen Thompson. Obviously, uh, James Allen was one as well. Las Vegas. Aye, Leighton Baines, that's a good one. Uh, our producer Paul comes in and says Pat McMahon. I don't know who Pat McMahon was. Um, what was the guy that played for Celtic? Ended up going to Motherwell. Jim O'Brien. Jim O'Brien was another that one that, 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 that played. That, uh, played. But what game did Christian Daly play for Celtic? Christian Daly played for Celtic once in his career. When did he play for Celtic? Must have been right at the beginning. I'm going to say 1990. Mm, you're 10 years out. He played for Celtic on the 16th of May 2000 when, Cel when Celtic travelled to Anfield for the Ronnie Moran testimonial. Jason McAteer also played for Celtic that night because... Kenny Douglas was a Celtic manager and Celtic were uh, ravaged by injuries. So Kenny phoned Blackburn. Christian Daly was at Blackburn and uh, Marketeer was at Blackburn and they played for Celtic as trialists that night. That's some knowledge, Kev. That's amazing. I, I was there. I was I was there right. that night. We got gubbed 4 1 and they had recently just built the Anfield Road stand and they had to shut it after the Celtic fans had been in it because it was moving too much. That that, right. that is a that is a true story. I've actually wrote a short story about the Ian Rush testimonial. It's on the Axon website. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll put a link into the the comments after I this. And that. Uh, uh, it's, it's on the Axon website. It's about the Ronnie Marat. It's about the Ian Rush testimonial when we got beat six nothing. See, we got gone to Anfield. Was the was the a good no. thing for us? Uh, that was a good day. That uh, the Ronnie Moran testimonial. But it was always quite strange for me. Um, seen Christian Daly playing for Rangers after I'd seen him playing in a Celtic top. I get it, I get it. I would never, ever, ever have known that. That's quality. I know, I know. Good knowledge. Uh, one again, it's one of the things, though, that I thought I had imagined for years because of the, because of the, like, the, the messiness of the day, shall we say. It was one of these things when you think back on it, you go, did I actually imagine Christian Daly playing for Celtic? <laughs> I did actually, actually imagine that, but ah, it, turned, it, it turned out to be true. Um, no, 20 minutes gone, and we break the deadlock with, for me, one of the most famous goals in Celtic's recent history. Gary Caldwell took on his uh, Beckenbauer heat and played the ball forward to the genius, which was Shunzuki Nakamura. Nakamura had been... He was getting Mark Nakamura was getting a bit of abuse in this game. Well, not in this game, but for his previous performances well, he, against well, yeah, I remember. Uh, uh, against Rangers. Eh? Folk were saying he was a bottle merchant against the Brutes for Govan. So he stretches to control this ball with his left foot, and it's a big stretch. I mean, my, uh, when I was watching the highlights again last night, my hamstring nearly pounded watching him actually uh -huh. trapping tra 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 the boy. Eh? Uh, How is he controlling that whilst he's doing that? Eh? Aye, he controls the ball. Then his he controls it. Then his next kick with his left foot, he sends us. He melts the ball into another dimension, and it looks like it's took about fifteen psychedelics as it swerves <laughs> out, out, out the road uh, past Alan McGregor into the back of the net. The place goes absolutely nuts. Where, where I sit, at Celtic Parks. Uh, it's at the corner, uh, section 412, eh? And mm -hmm. see, when he hit that that night, I'm like, wow. It's one of, for me, it's one of, the, one of his greatest goals 
Well, it's one of the yeah, greatest goals yeah. I've ever seen a Celtic Rangers game. Oh, well, I, I mean, no two ways about it. And do you know something as well about it was it was we speak about this with the with the, with the Celtic team right? It's someone make taking on responsibility and making something happen because we need something to happen, right? This is as you say, we're needing snookers as it is. We're in last chance saloon, whatever you want to call it. We need something to happen here. And I thought he just took ownership, took responsibility as the guy most capable of doing something out of the ordinary. He did sign at the ordinary. Um, mm. The strike itself is mind-boggling how he gets that sort of deviation of the ball. The movement itself is a joke. If you watch McGregor, he doesn't actually dive to the right-hand side because he's kind of actually took a step slightly to the left and then he's watching it move and he's thinking it's coming straight down. He's sort of straight down him. So he's dive. he's kind of... I don't know how the, a goalie would do it, but he's kind of just dived up the way. He's not really yeah. went to his right at all. And then he's realising at the end, oh my, that's now swerving. So it's it's went like, oh, it was it was insane. I mean, Bobby Carlos would have said, "Techers, mate, <laughs> that is, that's how you put swerving a ball." Um, I and I just think that start to the game, and you combine that with the Robson challenge, the face they open him, the atmosphere generated, and then magic happening. And do you know something? I'm actually surprised that it, 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 you know it became a a game that we only won so late on. We'll get get to that, but I think it had all the makings then of a, a 3 0, 4 0. I think at that point at the day, uh, no, we, is what I mean. we were on top in the first 20 minutes and it, it took that moment of absolute genius to break to, to break the deadlock. Eh? But again, we were played into Rangers' hands. They wanted to sit and a draw was good enough for them. They, they, they were quite happy to come out of Celtic Park with a draw that night, as I say. No, that's we, won't, true. We, won't, we won't get on to that. But when I, I, had, I think I watched that, that, that game again, well, that goal again, about four or five times last night, and I'm going, I still haven't got a clue how he's managed to do it. No. And and it's no one it's not like it's like that. What was the name of that board that they used in the African World uh, the South African World Cup? Was it the Jabulani or something like that? Uh, which uh, flew everywhere, know. eh? You're talking about this is a heavy ball. And Aye. when he's hit it, as as you say, it made it made Alan McGregor look stupid. Aye. But, but it's one uh, it makes Alan McGregor look stupid, but you go, you shouldn't feel stupid, Alan, because yeah. no. uh, it's one of the things you're never saving that. You are never no. saving that and and the uh, in a, in a month for Sundays, we're going at one. We're going at one nothing at half time. Do you, right? Do you think that's Nakamura's best goal? It's that or the Man United free kick, isn't it? And again, do you know what I liked about Nakamura was? See when you look at his best goals, I always loved the one at Rugby Park as well. Uh, and I'm now thinking of one he scored at Tanadice, which is quality as well, which is actually fault and play. I really like that as well. Mm-hmm. But the thing was with Nakamura, you look at that one, you look at the Man United free kick, and you look at the what was the other one? Uh, the Rugby Park one. The big moments too. Mm-hmm. So, you know what I mean? It's not this for all of, and I I couldn't agree more. I remember the chat being that he's no done it in in, in a Glasgow derby or whatever. Then I say old firm. I mean, like it's, uh, and see when he, uh, when he, when he takes, when he gets the pressure right on him, and we need something special to happen. I just think he had a, an amazing coolness personified. Just he was able to remove himself from like the situation. He was mm-hmm. able to take himself out of that and just focus on what it is he's got to do. And that's that goal from open play um, against against Rangers, right? And then you're looking at the other two are set pieces. So that's total variation as well. Do you know what I mean? And I just think, is it the best when he's scored? I think if we'd, if we'd won the game 1-0, you might say it. But I think the United one will probably just edge it for most people. I'm not, I'm not sure. No, I, I, for me, it's, it's, it's his best goal for open play. Uh, yeah. That wasn't then, a question. I know it wasn't a question. <laughs> no, it wasn't his question. <laughs> His goal at Rugby Park's got special connotations as well. Um, the, that that night, the the Van der Sar, I mean, he done Van der Sar twice in, in that Champions League group stage. I know. Uh, 
the, uh, for me, the one against Man United is utterly superb, but then it's overshadowed by Big Boric's penalty save, which the place goes utterly nuts again, eh? Um, I I, I, it's, I, it's been a privilege to actually see Nakamura. Uh, we spoke about this last week when we were talking about Bellamy, and we could not, I couldn't imagine myself to support a life no seeing Nakamura on a Celtic top. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm privileged to actually have seen Nakamura and Bellamy in a Celtic top. So no, yeah, I agree. you've got to appreciate good things. Eh? Yeah, I've got to no, appreciate good things. I agree. Eh? It's one nothing at half time and we're going to go into half time because the game sort of petered out to, towards half time. The second half hot's up right enough. Eh? But, but this game has got so many moments that to, to this, this day still bring a massive fire, massive smile to my face. It was one of, it was one of these dramas of a, a Celtic Rangers game, eh? Do you remember what happened at half time of this tie? Go for it. The Green Brigade, who were two years old at this point, mm-hmm. produce a banner. Uh, produce a banner at half time, uh, which is just along from me. And I'll, I'll tell you the story. I must have got to say the story because I didn't really like but I'll, I'll tell the story anyway. Right? Tell the story, Kev. The night before, a wee guy from Stirling who was in the Green Brigade phoned me and he says, look, we're doing a banner display at half time. And we, I know that you sit up there. Can you give us a hand? Because we're looking for guys that sit up there to actually drop this, drop the banner. And I'm like... I no problem, pal. I'll give you a hand. So I was told to meet under. I can't remember what stairway it was. So I went doing it half time. Met under the stairway. Just as I met, there was, there was about eight or nine years all there, eh? And just just as I met them, I got this panic because the boy says, "Well, oh, oh, that's good. You'll need to cover your face in that." And I'm going, "What the hell's on this banner? I'm fair. I'm I, I'm I'm in my thirties. Got an all right job." I says, what the hell's on this banner? What have I got my uh, what, what, what the hell have I got myself into here? Eh? <laughs> so, so we walked, so we walked up, eh? and I'm still going, I'm asking guys, I went, do you care what's on this banner? And boys are going, no, no, we didn't care what's on that saying. And I'm like, oh no, here we go. So we get right down the front. And, and and everybody everybody's along along the along the front. Everybody's gone. What he's doing, lads? I'm going. Oh, but we're doing a banner, blah blah blah. And I'm going. I'm shitting myself by this point. Eh? And I'm going. I don't care what's on this. So I, I've got I've got a a green and white Henley's hoodie on. So I shoved my hood up. I had a scarf on and I covered my face with the scarf. I'm going. I'm not getting this. And we dropped it. Eh? And the place went absolutely mental. It was a Scotland shame banner. Eh? Oh it, yeah, uh, the the, the, Scot, the the Scotland shame banner with a but I couldn't see it because we're up there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, the whole the whole crowd uh, goes absolutely mental, and I'm going. I still didn't ken what's I still didn't ken what's actually on this. <laughs> I went, yeah. and it wasn't it wasn't until it, it wasn't until after it. All, all I remember is the place going absolutely mental, and the guys who had done it, the boys that were in uh, the boys who were in the in, in the Green Brigade, they, they were going, "Wow, this is magic!" And they were all hugging each other after it and that. And what I remember about that day, when we when we when we had done it, or when the guys for the Green Brigade had done it, a steward came up and folded the banner and says, "I, you can get it. We've got a cupboard down the stairs." <laughs> he says, "You'll get it in the cupboard down the stairs," and he took it away. <laughs> So if if you look at that if you look at that picture, uh, I'll, I'll maybe post the picture. There's a picture that's took from just below it, and you can actually see just where the arrow is. You'll see a green and white hoodie. That's me. <laughs> that, that, that is me. But as I says, I that's really, brilliant. I crap myself. I must admit when I when I actually re- when I realised I didn't ken what was on it and gone. What? And the place is going nuts. <laughs> the place has gone absolutely nuts. Uh, aye, so that that's my that, that was my wee bit. That was only the time I've ever been an ultra. Aye, well, <laughs> that's only the time. Them, I've, that's only the time I've ever done it. You play the know, part. but I get that. I think you're already fearing the worst. Then you've done it, and then it dawns on you. 
this isn't over yet because I actually don't know what it says. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're thinking it'll take two minutes, just unfurl it, and that's it, job done. But then a new wave of panic must have came over you, and you're like, "What does it, what does it say?" <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> Aye, uh, it, it's uh, it, it, it was some buzz. I'm not going to lie, it was some buzz. But then I saw it took me about fifteen minutes to come to, back to, some, to somebody to tell me. I by the way, that's what was on it. <laughs> because, because, uh, it was quite funny, and that's that's weeks that's weeks before Manchester Day. That's weeks before they went down and totaled Manchester. Eh? So that's right. The, oh. See what I remember as well. The rivalry was hot then, though, wasn't it? Like it was at the atmosphere. You know that, that game, and there was another one as well. I remember. I think it was Mark Wilson that scored around Aye. the similar. Thought, yeah, a couple of years later, or whatever. But I think it was still Walter Smith in charge at them, and they still had a lot of hammer throwers then. Do you know what I mean? It was. It, it could it, it, that could have boiled over that game definitely when you look back. Eh? Uh, I mean, mean, mean the the banner itself. I think they've seen it this season. Eh, eh I, I think they've seen it this season that the the Celtic support have got a sense of humour, and even though that banner was making a point, there was the fact that none of the Rangers fans could see it up the top tier, so they didn't know what the Celtic fans were like. Going, going oh, mental what yeah, as well, yeah, yeah. and there was just a big arrow. It was the biggest wind up, uh, like uh, I had a, I had a message, but it was done in a jokey way, where it was a it was a wind up. Eh? It was an absolute wind up. Um, I that that's my wee part in the Green Brigade history. <laughs> this is my, my only part in the Green Brigade history. <laughs> Love after it. that, after that, I realised that uh, having a, an ultra with the fear of what was actually on banners probably wasn't a good look. So my, my days of being an ultra were, were uh, I, I retired after that. <laughs> I retired <laughs> after that. It was a uh, short but successful career, Kev. A short yes. but a glittering career, mate. <laughs> I know, I know. We're going to the setting half. Um, and as was typical of the spawny tadpoles at that point, they equalise after an honest mistake. Daly takes takes out Barry Robson in the middle of the pitch and Kenny Clark waves play on. The ball falls to Nacho Novo. Now, Nacho Novo was the ultimate wannabe panto villain. He wanted to be hated and he'd done everything to try and be hated. But really, he was mere like a widow twanky eh, for us to mock it and laugh. <laughs> Uh, he just he just became a comedy figure rather than a hate figure. He scores after Mark Wilson slips, um, and he somehow manages to score for the for the right hand side of the box. Yeah. For for me, when you actually watch the goal again, the holy goalie's at fault. The holy goalie should not get should uh, not uh, should not be actually getting beat with that shot for there. I think the holy goalie's positioning uh, positioning's wrong. What do you think of that? Well, I think that is that, that that's a good point. I also think, in fairness to to the striker, I think he has caught Boric off guard. I don't think you're expecting him to ping it with such accuracy for there. Um, mm -hmm. it's not one of his forties was scoring long range. Well, not long range, but you know what I mean. Distant shots with pinpoint accuracy is not something I would associate with Nacho Novo in the slightest. Um, he was just a wee pest. You know what I mean? Who, He'd still probably scored a fair amount of goals or whatever, but I think I think Boric at times was probably just too aware of who had the ball at that in that position and maybe just not treated it seriously enough and got his got his feet in, his feet in, foot in, uh right. It is a tidy finish and face when it is really accurate. Do you know what I mean? There's no two ways about that. When it when it goes in, I mean it, it, what he did hit the only bit he could aim for to score, but I I think I think Arthur Boric could have definitely, if he'd been positioned better, could have saved it. He, he would have been disappointed at that one. He would have been, eh? Um, Novo, eh? He, Novo dined out for years on this sort of persona that he gave himself, that he knocked us back and he signed for them. And he had the Rangers Sabuto team in 1972 because he watched them winning the Cup Winners' Cup. All that rubbish and like that. I've never met a Spaniard to Kenzo Rangers, ah, huh? unless you've unless the fans have wrecked their city during a European trip or something like that. <laughs> but he done a job. He, he always seemed to be a pain in the neck against us, 
and he was always just he was a pantomime villain. He was really a pantomime villain. But I think we had the last laugh with last laugh with him as I say. He was he made became a joke figure. Then, and then a hated figure. Eh? Aye, I just think with that goal as well though, there was it, from my memory at the time and watching it back obviously this week, it was like. There was a feeling like they might just scrape this somehow. Do you know what I mean? Because it's what, as you say, that's what they've done all season that year. And you just felt when that goal went in. And as I say, that first half, place was rocking. Momentum's with them. Brilliant moment at half time with the banner. Optimism's high and you're brought crashing down to back to reality. Do you know what I mean? And, and I felt, it was, I just felt that Celtic at that in that match, well, a better team than them, but yet somehow still you're finding yourself level pegging. Do you know what I mean? It's frustrating. They, they, it they, had frustrating. Done it, they had done it all season, basically. And they go one nothing up and you're going, this game now suits it because they'll just go back into their shape and do what, they, what they've been doing so well for the whole of that season. But on the 70th minute comes for me another memorable moment. Uh, no, because of what happens, because actually what happens has got a bit of regret for me. Uh, and I'm not talking about Scott McDonald missing the penalty kick. It's when Nakamura picks the ball up on the, on the, the right-hand side and he curls a great shot into the, what has gone into the top corner. It would have been another great goal to add to the, first, the goal that he scored in the first half. And, and see when I've seen that, that's what I'm trying to say, Kev. This was a guy who at two now occasions in the match has took responsibility and you, you, has complete faith in his own ability to do that. And I think we need to see more of that. Do you know what I mean? From the, from the, the current team, there's bags of talent in there, but you're, that killer instinct, I just felt Nakamura was taking ownership for the for the what, what was to be the winning result. And again, moment of absolute magic as you say that. That second attempt was... Again, I mean, it should have, should have stood. And like you say, you'd have then been debating which one was better. You would have been. Exactly. It goes one way, it goes the other. Goes, it's just, it's just, that, that, he's, get, he's getting bend way inside curl on that one. The other mm -hmm. ones, we swerve going like that. And we'd be debating right now, what's better, the inside than I can move foot the outside? <laughs> you know what well, I mean? He can, he can maybe give uh, Carlos Queller a bit of credit because he knew Nakamura was shooting. He was like, <laughs> this, this is going in this top corner, I better get there, eh? And I wish they didn't tip it over the because as you I see, we've been we talking about two fantastic goals by a player in a Celtic Rangers game. But then, if Queller hasn't punched the ball across the bar, we would never have got the best commentary that you've ever heard on a Celtic game in your life. You can the commentary I'm talking about. No, go for it. I right. can't think. Of, I can't right. remember the do, line. Do, do you remember in the when the internet was starting? There used to be a thing called Justin TV. Yes, that rings a bell. Right. Yeah. So on Justin TV, there used to be a Raj who used to call, who used to commentate on Celtic games. A right Celtic mm -hmm. fan, right? And he would be over the top in that. So. He, he was commentating on this game. He, he, he was commentating on this game, eh? So, Queller punches the ball over the bar, right? And the boy's got, the boy, the boy starts shouting, he's got to go, he's got to go. Yes, get it right up, yeah, he's got to go. And he shouts, Carlos Queller, Scotland's player of the year last year, is new a dick. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and in between all that, he's got like, I get it up, yeah, get it up, yeah, and he's shouting, he's shouting, shouting along, yeah. Eh? Then, then he comes, then he, then he comes up with another classic line, eh? And he goes, I if in doubt, cheap it, cheap. No, oh, sorry, if in doubt, cheat it out. It's the Rangers' way. <laughs> it's I will actually, it's still on Twitter. And I will I will post it. It's one of the best bits of commentary. Absolutely. Oh, I've never heard that. Oh, see when you hear it, Russell, you will. I, I did they do it justice. I, right. I did they actually do it justice. Right. The, the, the boy is like, 
the, the boy goes right over the top, but it's just that thing with Scotland's player of the year last year, but he's new a dick. <laughs> <laughs> How can you think of that man off the cuff watching the, watching this game? I often wonder what will actually happen to him because he just seemed to disappear as quick as, quick, quick as he appeared. Did. Um, it used to be Justin TV, and I think he used to have every I remember that, the name Justin TV, like. I do remember it. The boy had his own channel, and I can't remember. I can't remember what the guys, the the boy's channel was called. Eh? Um McGrory says the one that does the famous commentary on the Barca game. I, I can't. I can't. I can't remember the the Barca game, man. But I always remember this one with Queller, <laughs> which is the boy was a bit of a legend for about a season or two. Eh? Then he's just completely disappeared. So if anybody in the comments knows knows what. Happened to him. Uh, I would like to get him on here and interview him. <laughs> I think he would be quite a. I think he'd be quite a dude to actually interview. Um, so we get a penalty kick. Laura Bradburn, who what Justin TV became Twitch. I think. There you go. I wonder if that we learn something new every day. Oof. That that used to be the go to when you were looking for streams. You used to go to Justin TV. Wow, that, 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 that used to be that used to be the goatee. Eh? So Skippy misses a penalty kick. Um, that is a decent save. Um, but what I've got to say is McGregor's almost at the six yard box by the time by the, by the time uh, McDonald actually hits the ball. And these days a VAR it would it would have been a it would have been like retaken because he's yeah, that yeah, for, yeah. because he's that for. Uh, He's that far off his line, it's frightening, eh? But as the guy says, if in doubt, get the ref to cheat it out. That's the Rangers' philosophy. As somebody's just picked up on there, Sean Laird's, if in doubt, cheat your way out. That's the Rangers' philosophy. That's what the guy actually says. So, brilliant. Um, brilliant. <laughs> so, they're, they're doing to 10 men. They're doing to 10 men. And this, new, this game suits our boring rivals. They can just sit and they've got the draw that they want. We've missed a penalty kick. Our heads have went down. You're talking about a team here who the they get to a UEFA Cup semi-final a couple of weeks later against Fiorentina. And, and the Fiorentina manager says they played for penalty kicks in the first 30 seconds. You know, uh -huh. he, he says, oh, they were playing for penalties right for the start. And, and, they, and they got through. And they got uh, I'm, sure, game, I'm sure it was against Fiorentina. Me and my flatmate at the time were watching it, right? And cut Broadfoot Phil Shies twice. <laughs> a European semi final. <laughs> Have you? Can't even throw a ball in, man. <laughs> it's like, this is ridiculous. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> I, always, um, I always remember that two Phil Shies. I'm sure it was the European semi final. You're going, it's just a red neck, isn't it? <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> So we're going into the 91st minute, yep. right? And their fans are celebrating the draw. They're singing that they're going to win. Hee haw, eh? And like they're doing the bouncy, they're telling us to go home. I think Gary Caldwell again decides to stroll across stroll across the half wide line. Like he's another Beckenbauer moment, eh? He thinks he's a liberal. The, 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 a Berese, aye. Aye, a Berese. And it, he gets the ball about 30, 35 years out and he crosses it into the box. Uh, we skip it, out jumps uh, Whitaker. And if you actually watch the footage, Wh Whitaker claims that it's a foul. <laughs> He's flapping about the place, say, saying uh, it's an absolute he was, saying out, it's a foul. he was way out of position. McDonald's is a good yard and a half away from him. That's how McDonald's winning that header. He's not picked up McDonald properly at all. But uh, you're right. The arms uh, are going. Yeah, the, the arms, watch, the arms are going. It's so uh, over exaggerated what Whitaker did there. It's so like, it's it is it's it's comedy sketch material, man. But but uh, there you go. If in doubt, cheat it out, eh? Try and get right. try and get try and get everything that you can. Um, but then imagine imagine getting out jumped by Scott McDonald. <laughs> you must have knew that you're going to get you're going to get a you're going to get a roasting in the dressing room for that. What, what do you mean? Right. Oh, that wee Australian who's five foot done out jump chain. I know. <laughs> the header the ball back across. And there we've got, he headers it back across the face of goal and big Jan Venegura Hesselink with it to score with a diving header. 
past uh, Neil Alexander by this point because Alan McGregor goes off injured after the penalty kick. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've seen enough. I don't think we see enough uh, diving headers in the game, but this is a classic diving header into the back of the net. Eh? And if you think the place went bonkers eh, when Nakamura scored, it goes utterly bonkers when Va Jan Venegura Hesselink scores. Eh? And it doesn't finish there. I mean, the Celtic part's gone mental. The players are gone mental and all that. And they can't hack it. Davy Weir strokes Gary Caldwell. Him and Caldwell get into a fight eh, and a stramash starts. But what's really good about when you watch the footage now, I, I, did, I didn't remember seeing the footage. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't I don't think, like, you didn't, you didn't see the, I didn't see the footage at the time because I was too busy jumping about. But the whole team go into the stramash. And and who's who's the first member of the coaching staff on the pitch? Neil Lennon. Neil Lennon. That's the first <laughs> member of the coaching staff on the pitch. And he's he's thrown bodies away left, right, and centre. And uh, what they can say in hindsight, uh, hindsight is like I think that that's the moment that league was won when you look back on it because you can tell they flapped by that point. They can tell that they didn't fancy coming back to Celtic Park in a couple of weeks. Uh, their, their pants are beginning to flap like a bed sheet and, and a gale man on a, on a line. Eh? And the fact is, it's a perfect time to get your first win in a year over them because it puts that doubt in their mind that yes. they have to come that they have to come back. Yeah, it's removed, it's removed the myth that Strachan can beat Smith. It's taken that out of the equation and. I think secondly as well, I just think knowing there was going to be another one in two weeks and realistically, the Celtic players are going to look at the length they had to go to to try and get a draw with us that night. We were always going to beat them in two weeks' time after. I think you're right. I mean, if you're looking at a game in isolation as to when a pendulum can swing or when a league title can be won, ah, it's up there, eh? I mean, that was... You know, that they, I felt they'd given us everything they had that night um, and were willing to go to any length that they possibly could. And I think you're right about the Stramash. The fact was their heads had gone. And once you see all these, see once you add all that up and you go, you've got defenders diving in top corners, uh, getting sent off. You're, 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 uh, you're then conceding late goals because you you can't out jump because you're panicking that much. So we're seeing... Uh, we're seeing desperation, we're seeing panic in the defence, and then we're seeing a uh, loss of the heat with the, with the Stramash or whatever you want to call it. And you're now going, that is a team on the ropes. I definitely... And the momentum was where's, Kevin. Mm -hmm. And why was the momentum where's? Because Gordon Stratton had found a couple of partnerships in that team to try and get us over the line. And I think the first partnership that we've got to have a look at, but we'll have a look at the partnership with the goal. Uh, Venegura, Hesselink and Skippy up front. Now, they, they, were, they, they were a classic, like, they were a little classic, and large. little and large pair there. They, they, they're probably, the, they're probably the, the, the last little and large pair that we've had. I'm trying to think there, have we had one since? Because we don't usually have pairing of strikers up front now. They're usually wide players or like uh, three false up nines front or, or false, false nines, false tens. Patrick Kamalas, who knows what you, what they're meant to be? Yeah, but th this was this was a partnership, eh? And they scored fifty one goals between them that season. Uh, Hesselink got twenty one. McDonald got thirty. So it shows you good numbers. Uh, eh? It shows you they got good numbers, eh? I remember when we signed uh, Venegura Hessling. We signed him in August 2006 for yep. three and a half million quid for PSV. Yep. Um, and I thought we were getting a player. I mean, he had scored yep. 73, 73 players, uh, 73 goals for PSV. And he had scored quite a few in the Champions League. Because scored against he, Leeds United, he scored against them, sure. And it was his name that you noticed, Venegura Hessling. You go, no, there's that big fella scored again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just because he's named the longest name in world football uh, at that time, eh? And so you're getting a player for the Netherlands who's scored at a high level, 
with a European Dutch international. Pedigree. He was a Dutch international at this point as well, eh? You wouldn't but, get a Dutch international coming to Scotland, no? No, uh, uh, what age would he have been then as well? Because he was born, what, 78? So he would have been, what, 2008? I mean, he'd have been 29, 30 then. And when did he sign 2006? So we'd have got him at 27, 27. Peak years? Peak years Peak for a football years, player? Dutch international uh, striker? Uh, Come on. Uh, not lightly, is it, Kev, these days? Definitely not. Uh, not, not lightly, no. And, and, right, he was limited as a player. We're not yeah. going to deny. We're not going to deny that he wasn't even a. He was the Larson, and he wasn't even a Van Hoydonk. But he was a. For me, he was a typical Gordon Stratton signing. He was a functional player who worked who worked for his teammates, and I think his partnership with McDonald proved that that when he had a wee foil alongside him, he, he was he was okay. He wasn't mobile. He was injury prone, but he scored some big goals for us. Doesn't yep. make him a great player, but I think McDonald and Hesslink are remembered for this run of this season. I think this is the season for me. If, if you're mentioning Hesslink and Skippy, this is the season I remember them as a, as a partnership up front. I think Scott McDonald, um, I remember when he signed, he signed for 750 grand and he was sort of being expected to be the sort of third choice impact sub sort of strike he wasn't meant to, he wasn't signed to be playing week in week out i don't think that was in my opinion of him anyway that he was going to be signed to be first team regular at, uh, at celtic but what i always liked with mcdonald's was he had that 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 streak to him where he his desire or his commitment to the game or his his, his you know i know he was a uh, you know, folk used to comment on his body shape and that being a wee bit bigger or a wee bit larger or whatever, but I also thought he was one of those folk who put his cell about. Um, it just seemed to get it, and I think he he always played above his cell. Do you know what I mean? I think for the, for the, I thought you were just cutting me off there, Kevin. I thought you were <laughs> no. enough there, mate. I thought, fair enough. <laughs> uh, I, I think for his, I think for whatever he lacked in ability, shall we say, McDonald. And he did have ability. I'm not saying he didn't, by the way. But I think he made up for more in attitude, application, and just trying to just be like just a competitor, fierce, fierce competitor. Um, he, I mean, no one envisaged him having the career at Celtic that he did. You know, that you you look at the goal at Ibrox when he's chested it down, volleyed it. You look at him score against Man United, Milan, uh, big teams, big goals. He was not, my personal take anyway was when we signed him, that I would never see him getting goals of such magnitude like that. And you know the thing is as well, you've you've had the, the Cohones to take the penalty, fair play, you've missed it, but you make up for it. And he, rather than being, a lot of players what you'd find, right, see after they've missed that penalty, what they do is they want to make amends, right? They want to make amends. That ball comes over and he sends a daft head up to the near post that gets saved easy. He doesn't. He kept his cool with that header across goal. It was I, smart. You've summed it up there, Russell. We paid seven hundred grand for him, and he got the number seven. And he got the set the number seven jersey. And you were right about his body shape because, like, his ass was that big. It had his own weather system, <laughs> and, and he, 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 he always looked that angry. And yep. do, you get, do you get the players called him Stephen Hawkins? That was his nickname because he was a know it all. They, they say, I that we know it all, so they called him Stephen Hawkins. Is that right? That's right. Aye. That's brilliant. Who was the manager at Brunlum at a British football? Oh, I could get this Southampton. Uh, Dave Jones? Gordon Stratton. Gordon oh, Stratton. Really? Brun all right, Gordon Stratton brought him from this is a great name, Gypsland Falcons, an Australian signed him for Southampton in 2000. Wow, is that when he joined them? 2000, I wasn't sure was, if it was Dave uh, Stratton, I should have got that. Why else? Uh, Stratton, I and when he left Celtic, where did they go? Middlesbrough with Gordon Stratton as a manager. Again, uh, that, that's so it showed you we Stratton loved him. As a, as a player, eh? I mean, we all can what he done, we all can what he done in 2005, eh? And there was a bit of, there was a bit of a, a protest when we were go, going to sign him and that, but I think he repaid us. 
I think he gave us enough memories to actually More than repay that. Repay them, eh? It repaid them. Big Hesselink, I've noticed a couple of folk laughing that says it cost me a fortune to get Big Hesselink's name on his jersey. Um, it would actually, at the time, it cost you £15 to get his name, get the full name on the back of his shirt. And it wasn't a Veselink, it wasn't a Jan Venegur of Hesselink. The right English translation was Jan Venegur or Hesselink. It wasn't it off because basically the two names had equal society weight in the Netherlands. And when I've got it down here, no way. Uh, so, so rather than choose between them, the two, so in the 17th, 17th century, two farming families in an area of Holland intermarried. Does that mean they were related? I don't know, but the royal, I don't know. Both the, both the Venegur and Hesselink names carried equal social weight, so rather than choose between them, they chose to use both. Often Dutch actually translates to or in English. So his right name was Jan Venegur or Hesselink. There no way! There you go. That's, that's... I can't even believe that. Right? So... My whole life has been a lie, Kevin. <laughs> Oh, he had a great song as well, Jan Venegur. Eh? As, I, I, as, like as I say, he, he, he gave us big moments. He scored a goal at won the league at Tanadice. Uh, and, and I know some folk will say, oh, he was a lazy, he was a big coup, he done this and he done that, he was the, the greatest day. Eh? But I just want my Celtic strikers to score goals and give me moments to remember. And I think him and Skippy done that. <laughs> and, oh, that and, and that's and that, that's all we can ask, eh? We've mentioned this before on, on Screamer Celica, eh? But one of the most, one of the reasons that we won the league that season was a guy that we signed in January 2008, a 29-year-old who had missed a shot at the big time. But for, for the four months, the, the rest of that season, he proved an inspired signing. And for me, he cemented his place in, in folklore, and that was Barry Robson. Barry yep. Robson was signed for Dundee United in that January, and I, and I remember and, and I remember folk like saying, "What are we signing Barry Robson for? He's twenty nine. If we had not signed Barry Robson, we're not winning the league that season." One hundred percent. That that's how and that's how important Barry Robson was to us that oh, season. He, he was amazing, and you know it's funny because I was actually buzzing that we signed him. That's the honest truth. Uh, the, re the reason for that is. See, whenever we played Dundee United, I used to hate it when he took the corners. I used to hate it because I like, look how he hits that. But he used to whip it so nicely on his left peg. It used to cause his bother. You always remember, I used to get mm -hmm. the fear if he was putting a cross in. And then he was obviously getting his reputation for scoring free kicks and for scoring uh, sort of long-range digs. He was very much someone ready-made for the first team at that point. Now, just didn't have the glitz of being Scottish football's most expensive player like Scott Brown and didn't have the didn't have the glamour of coming from AC Milan that Massimo Donati had. But by God, did he have every single other attribute you could want, I thought, for what was the best way to describe it was that running was a sleeves rolled up job, Kev. Definitely. It was get the sleeves rolled up and there's two guys you hung your hat on to do that. Hartley and Robson in the midfield. From the, I was obsessed with both of them at that period because I just thought they are. They, it's so obvious they need to play every week. Like, it has to be them too. Again, it's so easy just to say expressions like they got it and all this stuff. But again, it's one of those ones where I felt they took responsibility. They took ownership of, right, we're in the trenches here and we need to go to war. You can hang your hat on me to, to do that for you. And what I mean, what I lack in pretty passing or pretty dribbling or whatever, I'm going to make up for it in effort. I actually think those two were more technically gifted than a lot of the, the players you described in the in the Rangers team. But were actually our retort to how Rangers were, were, were actually in the lead that season. And it was through blood, guts and thunder. Well, they had all that as well, but they also had quite a bit of ability as well um, combined with that. Hartley was one of those folk who was, by that point, he must have been 31, and he was 
he was no longer the box to box midfielder he'd been before. In fact, mm -hmm. I don't remember many goals he scored for Celtic, to be honest. No, with no. But, but he'd that's, scored... a... yeah, that's, that's another strikingism, eh? Um, I mean, basically, what Gordon Stratton actually done was when we signed Hartley, he was a box to box midfielder with, a, with an eye for a goal, and he had a bit of devilment about him, eh? But Gordon Stratton actually turned him into a holding midfielder. Got, but when we signed Paul Hartley, he was the best box to box midfielder out with Celtic Park. We had right. Pet, we, we, we had Pet off in that at that time as well. But he he was he was tearing up the Scottish Premier League being a box to box midfielder. He comes to Celtic Park and Gordon Stratton goes, I'm going to play you as a deep lying midfielder. Unbelievable. <laughs> and then, and like, you go and you go six years ago before that, he's playing what? He's playing wide right for St Johnston. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, he was a winger. I mean, what a mad, mad way for your, your positions to sort of adapt. He also, um, he also played at fullback a couple of times as well. Did he? Uh, he also played at full. He, he wasn't very good at fullback. He had no pace by the time no. he was actually play, playing fullback. Eh? I mean, Hartley, I mean, he was a pain in the arse playing for Hearts against us. He always seemed to have great games against us and that, eh? And what I also loved about him, like, he was the type of guy who could have a shave in the morning and have a full beard be honest. <laughs> 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 he, he could actually see his beard growing during games. Aye. <laughs> I've never had that problem myself, I must uh, admit. Either, either that, eh? And, it, it was, and also, he was a Celtic fan. He right. was a Celtic fan. He never had the fact he was a Celtic supporter. Uh, uh, there's a famous interview in a Millwall fanzine when he, when they asked him what's your dream, and he goes to play for Celtic. When he when he was really? a young lad, when he was a young lad at, at Millwall, eh? that partner, as you say, but you you summed up that partnership re really 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 well, eh? and for them, thank you, thank you. They, they they won us that league. You're talking about leaders on the pitch. You had McManus, who was the captain. You had Gary Caldwell and Folk Malign Gary Caldwell. But the game that we've just spoken about, if he didn't have the guts to play the balls forward, we're not scoring the two goals. And Caldwell was, was a leader. I was going to uh, touch on that as my wee piece. I thought, you know, Gary Caldwell frustrates the life out of me in interviews and that. And now I've got to be honest. I mean, when I hear him, I do. I don't particularly enjoy his punditry, if I'm being completely honest. I really don't. But Back then, he did get a bit of jet prank and he was better than what he was. But that Rangers game, he got it right the two times he took a chance on passing. And again, it comes down to that confidence in your own ability, which I can annoy you if something doesn't come off. But are you going to spend a life playing safe? Because that will get you nowhere in football, I don't think. You can't just play safe your whole career. Do you know what I mean? You've got to, you've got to take chances if you think it's going to make a difference. And again, you've got to then look at context, Kev. Mm -hmm. 91 minutes you're saying and he's going spraying one to the back post you tell me how many centre have stay in that not many no 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 many would I mean what, I don't think there was an arrogance about my hanky I think the fact it, we were in a period of downsizing at that time and our centre half pairing were Stephen McManus and Gary Caldwell and that didn't sit well with a lot of Celtic fans. But Stephen McManus was a leader, Gary Caldwell was a leader, and you had two leaders in the middle of the park. You had four captains there, basically, in, in the middle of the park, because Barry Robson could have been a captain, and Paul Hartley could have been your captain 100%. as well. You, you, had, you, had four, you had four leaders there, and I think that sums up like Gordon Stratton Celtic. He liked good teammates, and I think, he, I think he says that numerous times, like Paul Telford was a good teammate, a guy who was unspectacular. It was a team being made in the sum of its parts. They, they were an a actual team, and they got it right. We maybe weren't the greatest to watch, but I think Stratton's record now, when we look back on it in hindsight, is going, that was a, good, that was a decent record that he had. Very good. Very good. Very good. I mean, three, three in a row he won as well. Um, you know, and as you say, it's in a period of downsizing. I think mm -hmm. the fact we got that team the last 16 of the Champions League twice as well is something that looks better and better as the years go on. It really does. And you look at who we're beating there as well. And this is a, this annoys me with football these days, Kev, right? Because everyone says, oh, you can't compete financially with them. And I'll get 
example that you gave earlier, Benny Gurry Heslick's a Dutch international at 27, right? And But you're going, but we also did score with a 700 grand guy for, for Motherwell against AC Milan, who had Nesta Maldini um, at the back. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you look at, you know, you look at that team, that Milan team, and you go, is that really any worse than what the best teams are in Europe now? I don't think so. They were just as elite of level of players as what elite level players are now. And we were still doing it with guys that were 700 grand for Motherwell that would still cost us 700 grand for Motherwell now. So I think we sometimes are souped a wee bit too much into the old, the financial side of the game. Do you know what I mean? Want to know why, Russell? Want to know why? Because we were a well-coached side, an uh, organised side who knew their jobs. We went to the San Siro and we only got beaten extra time with a, with a cracking goal for Kaka, an absolutely peach, peach goal for Kaka. But that night we had Stephen Presley and Evander Snow playing for us. And we, Man, took, that it, mad. And we took AC Milan to extra time. Yeah. And it shows you, if you've got a, a decent coach, manager, who knows how to set up and organise a team, you can do stuff. And maybe maybe we're, we're, we're doing the boring Rangers side of that season a bit of discredit. Walter Smith knew how to organise a side. That's how they got to a UEFA Cup final. Yeah. It's because he knew how to organise a side. It's maybe too sterile, maybe too sterile for us who are old romantics and stuff like that when it comes to football and Strat but when you look back on it on Stratton's record uh, we were lucky enough uh, earlier, uh, what was over a year ago now, to have a night with Gordon Stratton uh, Paul interviewed him and I was getting a free dinner in the audience uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, it was a great night, it was a great night and I think as times went on with Gordon Stratton I think a lot of the Celtic support do not like him it, maybe likes a bit too strong word but I appreciate what he done as he says he didn't become as a Celtic supporter but he's leaving as a Celtic fan and yeah. his two laddies work at Celtic as well Gavin and he's got another laddie that works in the scouting department Oh, really? I didn't know uh, that. So, when, when he's getting a bit narky on Celtic TV, talking about uh, what the changes that are coming, he's just trying to protect his two laddies' jobs, eh? Well, you <laughs> well, you know what I mean? I, I know, I, that, that's how I laugh at some of the folks' reactions to him. I'm going, well, his two laddies are um, employed at Park Cape, man. What do you want to say? Oh, aye. I I, they they, they, they need right. to walk out the door. <laughs> See that striking? What's he doing with that iPad? Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? No way, man. No oh, way. Oh, I know, I know. Oh, brilliant! I, I enjoyed. That's one of my best games ever. That is one of my best games Classic. ever. I, I, I just had so many great moments. Um, ho hopefully, get many of the moments on Sunday, and we'll, we'll be able to talk about them on Monday. We'll move on to the music, Russell. Eh? Um. In the charts that week, number one in the charts was American Boy by Estelle. Do you I like remember? That song. Aye. I quite and, liked that song. It was a catchy wee number, that. It reminds me of going out. It reminds, aye, me, aye. It reminds me of going out. And, and, and I was 20, 21 then, do you know what I mean? It was always getting played wherever you went, in any, any club or whatever. So I suppose I didn't mind that. I thought it was all right, tune. If somebody would have said to me, is that song 13 years old? I would have been, nah, no danger, that's that's fair. That's five or six years old. And I always remember, that is, I, I, that's true. I always remember Kanye West in that song saying, Chain Belinga, and thinking, you're just, you get away with saying anything, man. <laughs> Chain Belinga. <laughs> Chain Belinga. <laughs> I, was, I was like, you're, you're just pushing the boundaries of what you, like, folk will like anything he does, man, at that point, you know what I mean? Chain I, Belinga. Chain Balinga. Uh, at number two was Black and Gold with Sam Sparrow. Again, I, I wouldn't again, would have, have thought that was 13 years ago. I would never have thought that no, was 13 no, no. years ago. Yeah. Um, at number six was Mercy by Duffy. That was a decent tune. Produced, yep, by, Bern tune. produced by Bernard Butler. Um, was it? Aye. Bernard Butler produced that album. Uh, number 17, Something Good, Utah Saints. Always a classic, man. I don't know it. 
He, he didn't think something could be Utah Saints. No? I don't think so. Oh, I don't think so. Mate, I'll need to mate. listen to it. Yeah, you'll need to listen to that. I, I, I reckon that you will, as soon as you play it, you'll recognise it. You will, you you won't get really recognise it. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. And in, in, in the album chart, uh, Duffy was number one with Rock Ferry. Yes. As you said, produced by Bernard Butler. Um, R.E.M. were number three with Accelerate. I know an album I'm, I'm uh, familiar with, truthfully. Number four, The Cortinas with St. Jude. Yeah, Cortinas, man. Yeah, Cortinas, man. I like, I mean, I, I like a few of the singles. I liked, uh, I, I think You Overdid It though was in the second album. I loved that when it came out. I thought it was a great single. Obviously not 19 Forever, it'll always be a festival classic, you know. But, but it's one of those ones, see not 19 Forever, my worry for it is it's going to become like LSF by Kasabian. When right. actually it just gets a wee bit karaoke-ish when you're at the festival and it'll actually probably start irritating the band. Do you get what I mean? By like going, mm -hmm. how many of you really are just here for that one song? Because <laughs> you've not given me a reaction for any of our new stuff. Or some have. But I found LSF, I always remember by Kasabian, just that, na, na, na. Like, it just getting a wee bit like, this is turning into a wee bit like, I don't know, pantomime or something. And I think the singing of the Not 19 Forever might just become, it might actually hold that band back in a way because I think it might just become, oh, we like the Curtinas for the festival for Not 19 Forever, and there's probably a lot more to them than that. Aye, um, I've tried to get into the Cortinas, and I, I just I've listened to quite a few of their albums, and I just didn't get it. I I, I just can't. I don't know. Oh, I just can't. I I, 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 I just I just can't really connect with it. And I can see your point with LSF, uh, LSF there. I've seen Kasabian quite a few times, eh? and I love that song. I really do. I, I think it's a great song, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if if they ever come back now, Kasabian as Kasabian. After no, uh, they, they can't really, you know. I, I don't think no. they can. I, I don't no, it's pretty dark that story. Like that was that was no nice at all. Eh? No, no, it isn't it? But again, a, a good festival band, Kasabian, a fantastic festival band. Um, I, I saw them. I think the last time I saw them was at the SEC. I think that was the last time that I, that I had seen them. In. That was a it was a decent night, an all right night. For me, they're like the primal scream. If the primal scream had never made ex uh, exterminator, you would you would never have had Kasabian, because I think Kasabian are based an awful lot on on that album, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, number ten in the charts was Hey Ma by James. That's a decent album. If you've never listened to that, James. Oh, uh, that, that, I mean that 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 was, that's one that I was swaying on talking about because, I, but my worry was not as many folk would know about it. But I suppose that's. I mean, Hey Ma by James defined my flat for a long time. And Did it? Uh, I looked at a guy called Shawnee Sherman, who's a huge fan of yours, by the way, Kev, and he'll be watching. He ain't sure brilliant, eh? So, hey, hey, Shawnee. <laughs> but he, he'll tell you, I mean, we had Hey Ma on a lot at that time. I mean, the intro, the, the, the opening track is called Hey Ma on that. Mm -hmm. And when all the guitars kick in, it starts with a wee slow acoustic one and then. I was listening to one on that the other day. There's a few good tracks. Bubbles is really good. Mm -hmm. uh, White Boy is really good. That's a that's a good CD. I recommend that to anyone. That's when James really got their mojo back. I think with with, with that album. Oh, all the later stuff, all the stuff that that they've released in the last ten years has been brilliant. Every, ah, every right. single album has been brilliant. They've got a new album out this year. We've interviewed uh, Soul. For James as well, eh? there's, inter there's interviews on the channel, eh? and, and they were the first band that I ever saw at the Barrowlands was James, 1992. Really? Uh, I saw James at the Barrowlands, eh? so they've always, they've always got a bit in my heart. Eh? Totally. I think I've seen them live 11 or 12 times, it's up to now. Aye. In a, in a variety of places as well, Kev, so we went on a stag do right to... Uh, Carlisle for two nights, I think it was, right? And we're coming back in the train, and I always remember, like, the boy I'm going with is sitting just with his head, like, on on the desk in the train, like, ah, I'm having a few beers again, man, I'm having a good wee time. 
<laughs> and I'm, I've got the music on my phone. I think it was Sound and Vision by David Bowie playing. I'm, a, I'm singing away in that, man. And he just goes, he just looks at me, he goes, who sings that? And I went, David Bowie. He goes, keep it that way. <laughs> but he said <laughs> it, right? And uh, I said to him eventually, like, look, mate, we're all hanging. We're going to, oh, what was the name of the festival? It was like an old warehouse in a muddy field in the middle of nowhere, right? And we're having to get dropped off there by his sister's man. He was having to come pick us up later that night. It was a mission, the whole thing, right? On the back of a stag do, Kev. You're going, we didn't need this, mate. And he's like, we've got to go. I'm like, you're the one who's hanging. I mean, I'll be fine, but you're, you're the worst nick I've ever seen anyone in in my life. And he's like, I was like, you do Ken Tim Booth's not going to mind if you didn't go. Like, I was like, oh, and then I even offered to pay for his ticket for him <laughs> just to put him out of his misery. So it was a surreal environment to be sitting in this muddy barn at the site, sitting down when James were on because we, we were dying, mate. Like, I tried to sort of get going in that, but he couldn't move. And I've got photos of the two just sitting on the floor like this. I've never sat down watching James in my life, you know what I mean? And I've also seen them uh, just to just to quickly talk about James, it just I seen them at the the Royal Concert Hall, and they did like a, a strings and choirs thing. Mm -hmm. So it was like I don't know eight folk in the choir, sixteen right. man string section. It was like fifty five, sixty bucks for the ticket, which was a steep rise as what they, they usually were, and that was sensational. And then I seen them play at the Toll Booth in Stirling, only I know four why. years ago. Mm -hmm. Four years ago, and that was really interesting to see them that intimate as well. And I've seen them countless times at the SECC, the Hydro, and all that as well, eh? and festivals. I haven't, I haven't seen them for a, a couple of years. I haven't seen them for a couple of years, truthfully. But I'll probably go and check them out when, as at the end of this year, I think they're touring with the Happy Mondays. Eh? That's the Happy right. Mondays are supporting. I, I will actually go and check that out because it's been ages since I've been to a gig. Um, it's funny that you says that you sat down, you sat, you were hanging and you were sitting down at a James gig. I went to see, I went, I went to see Mogwai at the Usher Hall, and there was a guy sitting down next to us, and he shot himself. He was stinking, man, absolutely <laughs> rotten. He was, man. Whatever, oh. he, whatever he had took disagreed with on me, and they, and he completely followed through. It was absolutely stinking, man. He got up and left quite quite soon after that. What eh? a stinker! Oh, oh, what a stinker, man! It was absolutely, absolutely stinking. Oh, man. oh no! Uh, right, oh, that 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 was you, eh? Kevin. I have that T-shirt for you that Saul gave me during the first lockdown. Thank you, Paul. Well. I, I'm sure I'll maybe pick it up now. We're, we're allowed to go back down to the studio from Friday, so I'm looking forward to going back down to the studio. Hey, um, oh, man. Right, let's talk about the two albums that we're meant to be talking about. Number two in the album chart that week is Shine a Light, the, the original soundtrack by the Rolling Stones. Fire ahead, Russell. So I just think, I don't know how many opportunities we're going to get to talk about the Stones um, in terms of the years that we've went for so far. So I just felt that we needed to pay our respects to, for me, the band that I would have been more of a fan of in the 60s than, uh, than the Beatles, definitely. I know that will split opinion. No, but, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it will split uh, opinion. I mean, just obviously that's why they're both so big. But uh, I just think I've seen them live. We were talking about it all fair. I've seen them live like three years ago, four years ago. And you think back to this album, Shine a Light, and they were at, uh, better level probably than what they were by Murrayfield but yet Murrayfield when I seen them there three years ago my, I just wanted to tick it off the list I'll be honest I wasn't expecting I, I, I wasn't expecting to see them being brilliant by any stretch I actually thought it was going to be a lot more backing musicians doing a lot of the, the music and stuff but I watched a band that to me was still very much in their own uh in, the own, in their own zone, like, they were very much still as relevant a rock and roll band as I could be wishing to see, and not just old guys coming out to play a couple of tunes we know that I can say I've seen the Rolling Stones. I left there with a completely different vibe. I thought, no, that was actually still brilliant. And I just thought it was interesting when you look back to 2008. So I looked through, like, their discography, 
and you look at the longevity first and foremost of the Rolling Stones. How many albums between real uh, recorded albums and live albums they've actually had out is astonishing. I didn't count them all, but you were scrolling mm -hmm. for a turn. And to be honest with you, it was quite exciting because there was a few live ones that I hadn't known they'd done, or I hadn't. It must have passed my my ignorance. You know what I mean? But I just think uh, when we talk about all the amazing artists we have. We look at the Rolling Stones in 2008, number two in the charts with another brand new live album, and just think, when will that, when will the love for the Stones ever end? And what year will they ever release an album that doesn't go into the top five in its first week of release? Even a live one, you know what I mean? I, I was, I went to see them at Murrayfield that night as well, uh, and, and as you say, they were, they were utterly fantastic from oh. the moment the moment they started. We started up to, yep. I mean, it was a, an hour and forty odd minutes that they done. It was it was close to close to two hours that they done, and obviously, like Mick Jagger disappeared for a couple of songs and all of that, just to go in his chamber and get oxygen blasted or whatever he actually get does. But back, Drink back some stage, aye, Drink um, some, aye. but. but as soon as you saw Mick Jagger doing that wiggle down the platform, you went, I'm quite glad there I came go. here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite glad I came here. Um, they, they'd headlined Glastonbury a couple of years before that, and I was always a bit wary of going to see these bands. And uh, 1997, the Who, was it 97 or 98? It was the day after we lost the league at Celtic Park, and uh, Hugh Dallas had got hit with a coin. All the guys that I hung about with at that point were going to see the Who at the SEC, and I was it was a month. It was a bank holiday Monday, eh? and I said I'm not going to see the Who, man. A bunch of old fuddy duddies, blah blah blah. And I wished to HUD now because it was a end. Well, obviously Moon was dead, eh? But end was always there, eh? But I went to see the Who in 2014 at the Hydro, and they were utterly fantastic. As soon as you see Pete Townsend doing that windmill, you're like. Aye, there I'm quite go. glad I'm here. And they go through the Tommy stuff and the Quadrophenia stuff and all of that. Um, absolutely fantastic. And I almost regret no going to see the, the Who in 97. So I was watching the, the Glastonbury Festival and the Rolling Stones headlined it. And I, I, says to, I says to my wife, I says, we're gone when they're playing in Scotland. We're getting tickets. I didn't care. I don't care how much it is. I'm going to, we're definitely, I'm, I was a bit like you. I'm going to need to go and tick off going to see the Stones. I'm not, going to make the, that's it. I'm, I'm not going to make the same mistake I made with the Who and, and uh, Jim Hannaway comes in in 99. I'm not going to make that mistake and go to see, well, they're not the original band, obviously, but the, they're a band that's got the most original members, eh? The, and, I, eh? and I was glad I went. It's like, but it's like a, it's a, it's a brand, eh? Everybody buying the t-shirts and you couldn't get near the t-shirt stalls and it's like it's an utter it's like a shot it's like a shopping like center. The, the, the Globe Trotters are saying the Harlem Globe Trotters, like they are just, they're more than just like Aye. a band. When you go there, you're, you're everyone buys into the full stones package and, and like Aye. I'm saying it's when do you think that's gonna that's not going anywhere ever until until they're dead. They're getting, they're still, they could sell a world tour tomorrow like that. Easy oh, they day. could. Oh, oh definitely. Easy yeah. day. And uh, I, I just think, I just felt for me when I seen their name on the list, I just felt it was number two in the chat. I just thought, firstly, that's nearly, what, 40 years since the first time they'd appeared that high on album chart. If not more than that, I more than that, over 40 years. Uh, and secondly, there's still, as I was saying, when I was going through the dis discography, I heard you say that one. Is that, is that you think? Discography, are you right? You're right. Aye. Like, when will that ever end? And, and I think it's important to, when we're doing this, to, 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 to take you to, when a big band like that's involved, you've got to kind of, Pay homage, my man, because I think you've uh, got to, man. Aye, I, I'm, I'm no, I'm no snobby anymore about all these old, old bands coming back now, which I was in 1999. Jim, <laughs> ha Jim Haddo in the comments quite rightly says, "Tick them off last Murrayfield gig." Uh, Richard Ashcroft supporting. That's now, right. Did you laugh when he started playing Bittersweet Symphony, Ken, and that the Rolling Stones have stole all the royalties for years for that songs off them? Well, the, the only reason Richard Ashcroft did the gig is because they made up. 
Aye, because he got because he got the he got the rights back. Eh? He got the rights back, but nothing back dated. Aye, I nothing felt... back dated. <laughs> The stone's like, how much money, more money do you can be made <laughs> off it? Oh, I didn't hear it there. <laughs> 20 years, son. <laughs> aye, I know. But, and uh, what, 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 what was it? Uh, is it Keith Richards says, I will take the money and he should come back to us if he can write a song as good. Well, do you <laughs> know, though, it's interesting. So, there is on YouTube talking about this, right? Another song where they reckon the stones bumped it from. That would probably be right. That would right. probably be right. It's more of a sort of soul song, and I can't remember the name of it. But you hear it in the background, and then so if you put into like YouTube, like the development of Better Sweet Symphony or the 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 transition of Better Sweet Symphony, you hear the very first one. It's not even the Stones. Mm -hmm. There you go, and it Aye. sounds but, mega. I mean, I've ever found the dumb was ripped off blues. So uh, it was the same with the Who, early Who and that as well. Eh? Some Somebody asked uh, Pete Townsend once, how did the Who get their sound? And he says, because we were rubbish at playing the blues. <laughs> he says, it, it, it was our take on what, what we actually thought the, blue, the, the blues were. Eh? As we're talking about legends of music, um, we'll go to Amy Winehouse. What's, what's, uh, you wanted to bring up uh, Amy Winehouse this week, so... Let's, well, I like the parallel weather. universes that we go down, Kev. I mean, I'm not going to sit and say I'm the biggest Amy Winehouse fan of all time or anything, but I think you've got to pay tribute to the fact that that was a someone who, if you look at the next, how the next 15 years could have played out, um, how amazing would it have been? Not because I'm the biggest Adele fan or anything like that, but she is a global superstar, right, that Adele or whatever she is. No two ways about it. She could sell records anywhere. Imagine, like, her and Amy Winehouse having a record out at the same time. It'd be brilliant, mm -hmm. man. And I think Amy Winehouse would have had a glass number of headline set in her easy days, like, a, like an iconic one, one that really stood the test of time. And I just thought when I seen that album there, I love the song Tears Dry on the Road. I think that's one of my that's my favourite song that she's on by an absolute mile. Um I just think, you know, how many albums could we be talking about now? Um because the thing was in my mind his music, it wasn't pop or anything no. like that. It's really, really soulful. It is produced the right way. Her voice is iconic as it is amazing. And I you just think I, I we always do what what could have been. And I wonder right now, but the flip side is, can you take certain sides to people's personality away from them? Can you dilute them and you get the same product at the end? Or is the reason it was so, that the vocal's so raw, it's got so much attitude in it because of perhaps some of her lifestyle choices at the time. She was a bit, you know, raw. And I think... It's an interesting one, but if 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 she hadn't passed away so tragically, I think that there would have been you could be talking about someone who you know already gets an amazing status in that, but I think you could be talking about someone right up there in terms of British female uh, artists like of all time. I think you're right, and and the greatest compliment I can give Amy Winehouse is like if somebody asked me now when was her peak. I couldn't tell you when she was in the early 2000s. If somebody says, what year was Amy Winehouse massive? I'll be like, I couldn't tell you. Because, because, her, music. because her music is still as big today as what it was at that time. And, way of it. and I, I think that long get, longevity is, is, a, is a test of time there with Amy yep. Winehouse. And it's always it's the same when you've got the, the other ones that joined the 27 Club. That's a great podcast, by the way. If anybody's looking for a good podcast to, to listen to, there's a podcast called The 27 Club, which is like a sort of true crime podcast about rock stars who died when they were 27. And so you've got Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, eh, Kurt Cobain, all died when they were 27. And so, uh, that, so it makes you wonder what all these artists might have done when they were when they, if they would have lived past past that age, would could you actually see Nirvana doing the Rolling Stones? Or no? could you see Nirvana still 
uh, selling out stadiums, then then uh, sell, smells like team spirit. I, 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 I mm-hmm. can't. Uh, I, I can't see I, that. I don't, think, I, I don't think he liked the vibe I always got was he didn't like the Stones to me. <laughs> definitely, as we just spoke about being the full package, quite like the world that they're in that environment. But I don't think I can imagine Kurt Cobain sticking out thirty years, forty years in no. the limelight as such. I don't think that was his his bag as much. That's the vibe I get. I mean, I don't know that much about him, but that was the, the impression I got was he. That was the side to see if you could just be making music and getting paid for it handsomely, but not actually having to do all the all the stuff that goes with that. I think they, 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 they all the stuff that Dave Grohl loves with the Foo Fighters. <laughs> 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 so true. Eh? Um, aye, uh, it's. I always remember a quote, an early, early quote uh, by No Gallagher. He says, oh, I, I can't see me at fifty doing this." And what age is he now? He's in his fifties, still, still doing the, still doing the live gigs left, right, and centre. Eh? Oh, so, right. I think if it's in your blood, it's in your blood. Eh? Um, I, I was going to talk about elbow, but I think after the Rolling Stones and Amy Winehouse, I don't think we can actually go to elbow on, after, but, after that. <laughs> um, DB comes in. Kevin Graham, you were really rude to the Helms delivery guy on the last podcast. Aye, I know it was, but we, I spoke to him the following day, and we've made up. And he delivered a nice pair of trainers to me the following day. So, but we're all cool. Me and the Helms guy are cool. So, it's they, been sorted. It's been, it's sorted. been sorted. I didn't, didn't worry about that. He apologised as well. <laughs> um, he did apologise. Right. My, my album that I'm going to talk about this week is The Seldom Seen Kid by Elbow. Um, I really loved this album when it came out, and, and it came out in, in April 2000, 2008, and it was the first Elbow album I, I, I really got into. And I didn't really get into it because of the big song on it, One Day Like This. Uh, there had a single before it called Grounds for Divorce, which I really, really loved. And, uh, and I understand why people... I, I like... I've said this plenty of times, and the Stones were the same, and Amy Winehouse is the same. It's taking something simple and making it so good. Something like it's, if you listen to Elbow, it's sparse. It's a bit like spiritualized. It's sparse, but they make it sound massive. And for mm-hmm. me, that's really, that's really, really difficult to do. It's really difficult to do something so simple and make it sound it sound so big. Um, and I, I, I really bought this album at the time. Uh, and it's one of these albums where if you listen to it on headphones, it, it's been it's been mastered a certain way that there's sounds coming everywhere because of the way that they've mastered it. Eh? I, I think it's a really good album. And obviously, I'm, I'm a bit of a, uh, I like to think I'm a bit of a writer, but uh, I love the lyrics. I love the I, I, I love the way uh, I love the lyrics and the, the, the way that he paints, the, the way that uh, Guy Garvey actually paints pictures on this album. It's it was one it's one of my favourite albums. Um, uh, this year, of that year, definitely. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Uh, no, fair uh, enough. I mean, it's like to me, it's a bit like um, they're a bit like in comedy, like the like Michael McIntyre. Do you know what I mean? It's just like family PG music. Do you know what I mean? It's just <laughs> just I, I can, so I can, I, friendly. Uh, I, I, I can I can understand that. I can understand that because one day like this. If, if you're a creative person, a songwriter, a book writer, or anything like that, your, your aim is to kind of write something that takes on a life of its own. The streets, the, the streets done it with dry your eyes. He'll admit that song doesn't belong to him anywhere because even though he's wrote it, it's that massive, it's got a life of its own. One day like this has got a life of its own. You've, you've seen it too many times. Like when England have won a decent game of football, it was the, the, the 2008 Olympics. It was used all the time on that. It's been used on children in need. It's been used on so many things. And you see their Glastonbury performances when they're getting everybody to wave and all of that. And it just a feel good thing. Way. And I actually think it devalues their music. <laughs> When yeah, become, I when, when, by that. When, I, when, they be, when they become that sort of pantomime like festival it, band, it reminds it? me of the type, a type of song a middle class family would be having their class ons and fresh orange on a Sunday morning <laughs> listening to. Ah, it's probably like <laughs> music. It's music for these folk who kid on that they like music. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
So I'll be on in the background when they're having their like avocado prawn sandwiches or something like that. Uh, aye, aye. And, like, I understand. I've got a load. Of, I've got a load of friends who are the type of people who don't like avocado. music. Uh, eat avocados <laughs> as well. I uh, who who don't like music. But if you listen to, if you have a go on their phone and look at their Spotify playlist, one day like this will be on it. Uh, that will that will be on it, and there'll be other staples of. Oh, look, I'm alternative. I'm cool. Will be on their playlist, but they, they have they wouldn't have a they wouldn't have a clue about all the rest of it. I mean, if I say to them, "Oh, what about grounds grounds for divorce by Elbow?" They go, oh, "I've never heard that song, but it's on the same bloody album. It's a better song." Uh, and 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 I I I don't know I don't know I don't a poem a Tommy Burns poem and. It's on my Twitter feed and that. I've watched that. And for me, and I'm not going to say that it's up there with fucking dry your eyes and all of that, eh? But that, that's no longer mine. That that has now got a life of its own. And that's, I mean, I've done it quite a few times. I've done it to massive audiences and that. And when people come up and speak to me about that, it's it's their memories. And what I, my words take them to somewhere else. And yeah. that... For for now, for me, I understand to a small, small, small smidgen level of what Mike Skinner and that mean when they say right. ah, that's that's no longer mine's. It would be the same way Irvin Welsh with train spot and he go, Well, that's no longer my book. That's that's the world's book. That's mm -hmm. so I understand what it means. And I understand why people would have that sort of feeling about elbow. Myself, I sometimes think they didn't do themselves justice, right enough. But I always um, hated the fact when he when he played live, he had like rolled up sleeves. Eh? I, I know we liked it. We liked doing Paul Hartley and Barry Robson did it, but I'm not having it. I'm not having him <laughs> out there with uh, Ringo Jumper. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, come uh, on, man. Played the, the, fifty thousand folk, and you've got like the rolled up Willie Jumper, not for cotton or whatever, but type of wheel jumper. It's like, come on, man, cashmere and rolled up sleeves, just like. Just not, nah, not having it, man. Uh, it's like a Tory party conference about eh? <laughs> uh... <laughs> right. So the night I've 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 says I've liked dinner party music and I'm a, and I couldn't be an outlaw because I shat it. So I think I think I think we'll, I think we'll end it there. Uh, <laughs> I think we will end it there. Brilliant, right. Loved it, uh, Kev. Uh, Loved brilliant. It. Uh, we'll be back again next week at half past six and hopefully um, we'll be back on Monday. Hopefully we'll have something to celebrate on Monday. Uh, but we'll be back here on Tuesday night to have a laugh anyway. So thanks very much for tuning in. Give us a like, give us a follow. Uh, Subscribe tell you, to the channel. Tell your mates. Mind. Uh, <laughs> tell your mates. Tell the folk that... Tell your folk that you even didn't like uh, to listen to us, eh? And uh, I'll see you all later. And remember, Dunny be an R.